This is CBC Here and Now. Preventing the pandemic one stitch at a time. I'll tell you how some people here in beautiful Trinity Bay are helping stop COVID-19. Coming up on Here and Now. It's hard enough as it is working from home. It gets even harder when you don't have access to your cell phone. And that's exactly what some people in St. John's are going through. It's definitely been difficult. I'm Jeremy and I'll have that story coming up on Here and Now. There's a potential for some tropical moisture to bring some heat and humidity this weekend. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Peter Cowan. Sewing machines are humming across Newfoundland and Labrador this summer, and they're making something new. Many of this province's highly skilled craftspeople have been recruited to the coronavirus cause. Here Now's Mark Quinn explains. This machine is helping stop COVID-19. It's one of dozens of sewing machines in rooms like this one in Hearts Content, all making protective equipment. We're used to sewing seal skin and uh, it's, it's different. Um, but it, it's, you know, we're, we're coming into our own with it. We're getting used to the different fabrics and uh, how to stitch. We use different needles and threads. And so everything is a little bit different. But uh, yeah, it's, we're coming into our own with it. Of course, she's being modest. Their handiwork was recently approved by Health Canada for use in hospitals. They've sewed products for Brian Tobin and Jean Chrétien. Definitely an honour, but perhaps the PPE they're making now matters more. This is the second slave. Pitcher says her sewers didn't hesitate when asked if they could make the switch. Well, the first thing, uh, we wanted to help out. Uh, at the time, uh, COVID-19 was just coming on. They were talking about the stress on the healthcare system for PPE. And uh, that was our first intention was let's, let's go and do what we can. About a dozen people in this Trinity Bay community are making personal protective equipment. It's part of a larger effort coordinated by Task Force NL. They've got many businesses around the province making PPE and thus reducing this province's reliance on PPE from outside of the province. So we're pretty proud that we were able to get to uh, where we've gotten to so far. Lately, the former provincial finance minister has been working here at St. Bonaventure's College in St. John's. But she's also the volunteer lead for Task Force NL, the group that's trying to make sure that health workers have all the protective equipment they need. Bennett says getting Health Canada certification for local products was crucial. The certification was extremely important. We met with um, the public sector unions, particularly the healthcare unions and the Federation of Labor, uh, very early in the process to explain to them what we were doing. And you know, we made a commitment, I did on behalf of our volunteers, that we would make sure that whatever we manufactured in Newfoundland and Labrador um, met the standards that they expected in the Canadian healthcare system. We've had a good long run with no new cases, but that doesn't mean Task Force NL is putting on the brakes. They hope to produce tens of thousands of face shields and gowns every month. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Masks have been a symbol of the pandemic, and in Canada's biggest city, they're the law. As we reported earlier this week, Toronto now has mandatory masks in all indoor public spaces. Ottawa has done the same, Montreal is about to follow suit, but in this province, health experts say they don't see many people wearing them. Here now, Zach Gowdy grabbed a pen and paper to take a rough count. No shirt, no shoes, no face covering, no service. The biggest city in the country has made mask wearing mandatory for all indoor public spaces and public transportation. Ottawa has already joined Toronto, Montreal is right behind. In Newfoundland and Labrador, public health officials recommend wearing a mask, but the choice is largely up to you. So, what are people choosing? Let's do an experiment. Okay, here's how this is going to work. I'm going to park at three different grocery stores in St. John's, sit there for 30 minutes, count the people exiting the store, and record whether they are wearing masks or not wearing masks. I'm going to exclude store employees and children, but otherwise, keep it simple. Just observe and record. Of course, this is not at all a scientific approach, so let's bring in someone who does know the science on mask wearing. My name is uh, Donna Morleo. I'm a professor at 
Lincoln Memorial University Faculty of Nursing. As you go about your daily life, what is your impression of mask wearing right now? I think there's a lot of uncertainty in this province about whether people need to be wearing masks or not. So I think I'm seeing a little bit uh, less mask wearing than I did certainly a couple of months ago. What do you think of my approach of uh, just counting people at the grocery store as a way to measure this? I think it. As long as it's interpreted as, I was at the store today, and that was today, that was the snapshot, that was today, that's it. I can't generalize to the store down the street or around the corner. I think you would need a wider sampling to be able to draw any real conclusions. It, it, it gives you a starting point for the discussion. For what it's worth, in 30 minutes, I counted 161 people exiting a Dominion store. 43 were wearing masks, 27%, or roughly one in four people. At Coleman's, I counted 97 people walking out over 30 minutes. 24 of them were wearing masks. That's 25%, one in four again. At Costco, I counted 325 people leaving in 30 minutes, but 145 were wearing masks. That's 45%, almost half of all customers. The big difference here is that Costco is offering every customer a free mask right at the door. So on the one hand, it seems like this simple strategy can really increase mask wearing. On the other hand, while I was watching, a solid half of the customers still chose not to wear a mask, even when they could have picked one up for free. Moraleo says there are medical reasons why a person may choose not to wear a mask, but whatever a person chooses, casting judgment is the wrong way to go. The idea is let's not shame those who are not wearing masks because we don't know what their circumstances are. I think the other side of the coin is we also have to stop shaming or belittling people who are wearing a mask. In Toronto, a small group of people protested the city's mask policy, openly not wearing masks on the subway. In this province, government says that following the big cities with a mandatory mask policy isn't being considered for now. Certainly uh, the expectation is that if you're in a public space and you can't maintain physical distancing of at least six feet that you would wear a mask. The compliance with mask wearing is not as, as high as we'd like to see. I certainly haven't uh, seen a lot of it myself when I've been out around. Some businesses like Ethereal Boutique in St. John's are setting their own rules and requiring all customers to wear a mask. Donna Moraleo says we should all try to get the numbers up and soon. I don't know if people realize that as we open up more and more are coming in from outside of the province, some of them are going to be carrying the virus. And so that's how it enters society. So as we move forward over the next few weeks and months, it's going to become increasingly important to contain the virus and to wear masks. And I think that's what's happening in the bigger cities right now. Zach Gowdy, CBC News, St. John's. Well, schools are going to have enhanced cleaning protocols and procedures in September, but the English school district isn't guaranteeing extra custodial staff to get that done. Critics say cleaners are already overstretched and that more are going to be needed to brought in to keep students and teachers safe. The resources that were in these schools pre-pandemic are not going to be sufficient to ensure the safety, uh, the cleanliness of the schools from a virus perspective during the health emergency. So casual staff are not going to be the answer. A full-time complement of dedicated staff for each facility is a necessity, as we've already seen in the healthcare sector uh, and other public buildings that's been opened. This is going to be downloaded onto the schools and into the teachers and staff in the schools. They've already got enough in the thing. If cleaning is a priority to make schools safe for teachers, and students and parents and visitors to their school, then you've got to put money into it. You cannot simply say, we're not going to assign additional resources. That is not a plan. That's a prayer and a hope. The English school district is actively recruiting c casual janitorial staff. Before the pandemic, when custodians called in sick or took unexpected leave, they wouldn't always be backfilled. The district says the new casual pool will help make sure students or schools rather don't go down a cleaner during the pandemic. It says discussions around bringing in additional cleaners or adding extra cleaning hours are happening with the Department of Health.
like us, the department, uh, health and safety is paramount. There's no, there's no compromising. We are working with government. Uh, they are very open to supporting this. And if we need to put casuals in there uh, on a regular basis, even with our, our uh, regular custodians to keep up, then we'll, I'm sure we'll, we'll reach an agreement on that as well. Households in some isolated Labrador communities will be getting $250 to help offset the costs of the coronavirus. The province says about 1,200 families in Nunatsiavut, Natwashish, Mud Lake, Black Tickle and Norman Bay will be eligible for what it's calling the Pandemic Relief Grant. Community leaders identified Labrador as a vulnerable region because of its geographical location and remoteness. According to the province, the measures to contain the spread of COVID-19 had a significant impact on isolated Labrador residents. The total cost of the funding is $331,000. Well, it will be a different scene on George Street this weekend. Dr. Janice Fitzgerald has issued an official order. Bars may remain open, but they'll have to operate at 50% capacity. As we reported last night, the NLC will be enforcing COVID regulations downtown. Many people complained after these pictures on social media showed crowded bars over the last two weekends. Service NL is investigating four complaints. Dance floors are also going to be officially prohibited and social distancing rules remain in place. The order applies to all bar establishments in the province. Well, it's the first place where it's farmed here, it's grown here and packaged here. It feels like such an accomplishment, honestly. It's been a long time coming. You can purchase cannabis from Cornerbrook all over this province now. I'll take you inside the beehive. Well, working from home is already hard, but take away your cell service and it's a nightmare. Residents in the west end of St. John's have been cell phone free for months after a tower collapsed. And as Here Now's Jeremy Eaton explains, there's some good news on the way. It's definitely been difficult. Uh, that might be a bit of an understatement. but Jamie Lewis hasn't had an easy ride during COVID-19. Working in communications and marketing, a cell phone is an important tool for the trade. But living in the west end of St. John's, she hasn't had cell service in her home since February. I wouldn't be considered a central worker, but working in communications, oftentimes it's a lot easier to just pick up the phone and call someone, and that's not an option. The reason she's getting no bars at home is because of this. A storm back in February knocked down this cell tower on Black Marsh Road, an outage that has dragged on for months, making working from this space a lot more challenging. A lot of back and forth communication via email to figure out, because, uh, you know, thank thankfully we have these, these tools like Zoom and, and Skype and everything, um, but I find everyone kind of uses a different service, so uh, a lot of back and forth to try and figure out, okay, what's the best way to actually, you know, uh, get a hold of someone or, um, you know, if they're maybe not so technically savvy, that becomes an issue too. The great thing about talking to someone on the phone is that you can just pick up the phone and, and talk to them as opposed to like long email threads and stuff. Um, so it just adds another layer of difficulty to an already difficult situation. It's a tightrope walk balancing work and child care in a home with no cell service. I don't have a landline, no. It's not something I've ever had. We don't have cable, we just have we have fiber off internet, which actually has been uh, not up to speed. I guess certain times a day, maybe more people are video conferencing and things like that. But getting a landline isn't something she was willing to pay for. We have discussed it. It's a hard pill to swallow when you're, you're paying for a service that you're not receiving. And then you have to go and invest more money in a service that you shouldn't need. Lewis has called looking for answers about when this tower will be up and running. I actually did reach out to them and they got frustrated because they couldn't hear me on the phone. Good news is on the way for Lewis and other people in her situation. A spokesperson for Bell says that work has been completed on the tower here behind me. They are doing some final testing, but it should be up and running in a couple of days. Jeremy Eaton, CBC News, St. John's. Well, even if you aren't that fond of the work from home experience, your pets probably love it. Soon, all that uninterrupted time with their favorite humans is going to be cut short as more people return to work. Chris O'Neill Yates has everything you need to know to keep your pets stress-free.
through the transition. For months, Finn has enjoyed his owner's undivided attention. But as of Monday, Glenn Redmond, who's also a dog trainer, is heading back to work. And Finn, well, he'll be on his own for most of the day. Last couple of weeks, I've tried to leave a little bit more so he gets used to the fact that, you know, he's not coming every single time. We've all heard the horror stories. Owners who come home to find their house destroyed. Well, the first thing is not to punish the dog because, you know, the dog lives in a one-second world. So the dog is not at home ripping up the sofa going, I'm going to be in so much trouble, but I, but I just I have to do it. On Monday, Redmond says he'll leave for work calmly. No fussing over Finn with an emotional goodbye. All we do is raise the dog's energy levels and then leave, which, which can then sort of, you know, uh, be put into uh, destruction on your couch. And when he arrives home at the end of the day, again, no big fuss. Because then at least we're rewarding calmness, not excitability. Our hypothesis is that the dogs who will be distressed when people go back to their normal life are the dogs who already had problems. Dr. Karen Overall is part of an international study on behavioral problems during the pandemic. We see always on top of you and staring at you and licking you and looking at you. And if he is, that's not a normal behavior. That behavior requires some professional help, says Overall. But owners have no reason to feel guilty about going back to work. Spending as little as 15 minutes a day just quietly with the dog, just talking to them and massaging them, not only decreases the dog's stress level, but has benefits for the humans. Good dogs before the pandemic will be good dogs when their owners return to work. And Finn, he'll enjoy every minute of extra attention while he can. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, Conception Bay South, Newfoundland. Some thunderstorms are rolling through Labrador as we speak. Now there is a little bit of a cool down tomorrow for parts of the island with some rain on tap as well. I'll have all the details coming up.
This weather update is brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. This year, it's Stay Home Year, the year to rediscover home. Welcome back to Here and Now. Ashley, just as you promised, those temperatures have been creeping up as we go throughout the week. And in fact, it was so hot in Happy Valley Goose Bay that they even had a little bit of a thunderstorm pop up this afternoon, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, we talked about thunderstorms, the potential for thunderstorms yesterday, and uh, that certainly did happen earlier this afternoon. Let's take a look at a video of some thunder and lightning in Happy Valley Goose Bay. You can see that uh, it has been happening. It's been relatively unsettled for the past couple of days, but mainly we've been seeing those thunderstorms in Lab West. And then we've got another video here uh, showing you some hail from wow. uh, one of the systems there as well. So. Yeah, so certainly uh, a little bit of some unsettled weather. Now that risk will continue. Let's take a look at the uh, satellite and radar right now. We have uh, the systems rolling through and some showers for parts of uh, the island as well. That will generally continue as we head through the next couple of hours anyway. If I zoom in, you can see just where those thunderstorms are developing in a line uh, from pretty much Happy Valley Goose Bay all the way through to the coast now. And again, like I said, that risk will continue over the next few hours. But temperatures this afternoon were very warm, 26 degrees in Happy Valley Goose Bay, uh, 25 in McCovic, 24 in Lab City. And then we've got those temperatures in the teens right across the board for the island but once those thunderstorms rolled through here's your current temperature it dropped six degrees uh, eight degrees there uh, this afternoon so down to 18 degrees uh, as we speak so that risk will continue for the next few hours they should taper off and then we should actually see some clearing skies and then the shower activity across the island will continue to creep a little bit further east making its way towards the Avalon or at least the potential for some showers for the Avalon overnight tonight generally staying cloudy for the majority of us and then we'll see some drizzle as well temperatures will be sitting in the double digits just uh, about 11 degrees 13 for Port of Bass 9 for uh, St. John's and those winds will be generally light and or easing through the overnight tonight right across the board and then staying mild again for uh, Lab City you'll see a low near 13 tonight. Now tomorrow the clouds should actually start to clear into the afternoon for most of the island even up through Labrador as well mix of sun and cloud chance of some uh, showers in the afternoon for pop-up showers for southeastern portions of Labrador and then the risk of thunderstorms again in the west and eventually those skies will clear uh, towards eastern areas as we head into pretty much the evening and uh, some more uh, cloud cover will move in from the south as we head into the early morning on a Saturday. So temperatures will be a little bit cooler again in the east tomorrow anywhere from 12 to as much as 14 degrees. The winds will be generally light though, anywhere from 10 to 15 kilometers per hour to the southeast. As we head further west, that's where that heat will be. Mid to high 20s with uh, some sunshine in play. Uh, some showers possible for St. Anthony, like I said, uh, about 18 degrees. And then gross morn, you should see a temperature near 22. Temperatures will be warm again tomorrow. Hot and humid air uh, continuing for Happy Valley Goose Beer. Goose Bay nearing the 29, maybe even 30 degree mark, and then 28 degrees for Churchill Falls. Along the coast, your temperatures uh, still in the 20s, but again, with that risk of some showers. Looking into Saturday, things look a little bit unsettled up through Labrador. Lots of heat and humidity is going to move in as we head through Saturday evening into Sunday. And this is because the remnants of uh, what's developing now, potentially tropical storm uh, Fay, and that will be that. So it'll bring some of that humidity with it, certainly some moisture, definitely gonna have to keep an eye on that one. If it brings anything, maybe just some rain and some gusty winds, uh, shouldn't be anything too much. But again, those showers will uh, develop again into Saturday afternoon for the island. Temperatures will recover nicely on Saturday into the back into the 20 to uh, mid 20s to high 20s for most of the island. And then same temperatures again up through Labrador. So heading through the weekend, it looks like we should hang on to those temperatures in the 20s right through Monday. And then another little bit of a cool down as we head into the middle of next week uh, for St. John's and East Eastern Newfoundland back into the teens. And then for Central Newfoundland, mid 20s and then staying that way through Monday and uh, 
hopefully hanging on to these 20 degree temperatures through Tuesday as well. Unfortunately, the western areas of Newfoundland, you're looking a little bit unsettled as we head into the beginning of the week. For eastern Labrador, plenty of rain on tap right through Monday, and then that sunshine will return into Tuesday. And then same thing for western Labrador with a temperature near 21 degrees by Tuesday. I had to share this great shot. This is Trooper. He's enjoying Brigus. A beautiful shot there. Thank you so much to Judy King for sending that photo in. If you have any weather photos to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Looks like Trooper got a haircut there, Ashley. <laughs> the owner of a pot producing facility in Corner Brook says she has a better, fresher product to sell customers in this province. Here now is Colleen Connors takes us inside the beehive the only grower here licensed to sell right now. Cannabis plants are shooting up in every room at the Beehive. This is the only place in the province where weed is farmed, grown, dried, packaged, and sold. So there's no one in the province except Beehive growing and selling locally. Approval from Health Canada came in May, and the province's liquor corporation came through later. Now, prior to the sales deal, all legal cannabis sold in this province has come from elsewhere in Canada. It feels like such an accomplishment, honestly. It's been a long time coming. We started back in 2017, so it's been a few years. And of course, then COVID happened in the middle of our whole uh, process with Health Canada. So that kind of slowed things down a little for us. The company brought back some employees this week who were laid off during the pandemic. Paul believes there is a real demand for her local product compared to the cannabis brought in from other parts of Canada. So, so far what I'm hearing about product is uh, it's not well liked. It's, you know, people are buying it, but they're calling it dry government pot. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to put something in the market that Newfoundland would be proud of. And I didn't want to put dry government pot out in the marketplace. Um, I mean, people are still going to black market because of the dry government pot. So uh, with us, you're going to get fresh product. Beehive cannabis has shipped to stores in St. John's, Portugal Cove St. Phillips, and Labrador City. Hall says customers are buying the one gram bags and trying out the product. The company just made a sales deal with the sea shops in Dominion locations across the island. Paul has invested millions in her business and hopes to see a profit in a couple more months. We're not seeing the benefit from it yet, like as far as financially goes. We've been throwing money out, but we're just selling now. And staff at this facility are so excited to finally be making a profit. The cannabis from Beehive will be available online in Cornerbrook by the end of this week, and it will be in sea stores across the province in a couple more weeks. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Cornerbrook. Political parties are private organizations. They do have rules that govern them to a certain extent, but nobody has a right to be a member of a political party. Nobody has a right to vote for the leader of a political party. Who can vote for the leader of the Liberal Party? Well, a voting controversy is the latest snag to hit the Liberal leadership race. Coming up next, we talk to political scientist Kelly Bleduc, and he'll weigh in.
both for the numbers who signed up and for the numbers who were rejected. In total, there are 33,500 people that the party has approved. That's more than the party had signed up during the 2013 campaign, which was longer and had more candidates. But more than 1,000 people were rejected. It could be because their form was missing, or they could have also it was decided that they didn't support the aims of the party. And out of that thousand that were rejected, about a third said that they were planning on voting for another party or didn't check the box to say they supported the aims and objectives of the Liberals. So what should we make of these numbers and the complaints by some people who say they were re rejected unfairly? Well, Kelly Bladuke is a political science professor at Memorial University, and we've reached him to uh, get his take on this. So the party's fa fa faced a, a fair amount of criticism of this. Kelly, what, what do you make of the number that were rejected and the criticisms they've had? Well, so it sounds like about 1% of the people who signed up were then decided uh, that they, they were ineligible because they, they actually wanted to support a different party if there were an actual vote held, or because they simply said they weren't really a supporter of the aims and objectives of, of the Liberal Party. I mean, that's a relatively small number, but I think it also, you know, it, it does get to the heart of, of what some people thought they were doing in signing up. A lot of people thought this is an opportunity to support or to decide who the next Premier will be. Uh, so I think there's a little bit of, you know, maybe confusion on some people's minds as to what their, their rights are to be involved in this process. They're, they're, they really don't have those rights. A lot of people think they should. This is someone who's going to be governing for up to a year. Why shouldn't they have the right to be able to be involved in that process? I mean, when we talk about democratic rights in Canada, basically we're talking about the fact that, that all citizens of a given age are allowed to vote in elections and, and have the right to do so. That's separate from choosing leaders or choosing candidates for political parties. Political parties are private organizations. They do have rules that govern them to a certain extent, but nobody has a right to be a member of a political party. Nobody has a right to vote for the leader of a political party. All of those rules are made up by the party, and, and the party can change them and, and, and use them in the way that they want to. So last night on the show, I talked to Robin Legro, who was one of those thousand people who was rejected. Uh, she's not sure why. She doesn't think the party should have been doing those robocalls, asking people who signed up who they plan to vote for. Here's what she had to say. If they don't want people who aren't going to vote for them down the road to be a part of this, how do they expect to uh, bring in other people outside of the Liberal Party to vote for them in the provincial election in a year when they do go to the polls. It's it's pretty unfair to say, oh, it's okay, we don't want your vote now, but we'll take it a year from now. What do you make of her argument there? I mean, I understand the opinion there. I, I did actually read the post that she put on Facebook previously. I, I, I don't fully understand why the party would have rejected her. Um, and so I would just say, I, th I think that was actually a mistake. I think maybe even doing the entire vetting process could have been a mistake. Uh, but what she's getting at is, is kind of two different things. So on one hand, what the, po what the political party, the liberals are trying to do right now is, is determine who their leader should be and, and do the sort of best process for that with the interests of the liberal party in the minds of the people making that decision. That is quite different from asking people whether or not they'll support candidates in a general election. And as I noted earlier, there's also a difference in terms of people's rights, which is to vote in a general election for whomever they choose, versus having no right whatsoever to, to involve oneself in a political party. Isn't the party trying to have it both ways, though? Because it used to be that you had to be like a paid member of the party. You went to a convention, and there was this whole sort of inside process. They've tried to open it up and say, you just have to be a supporter. Don't even have to pay any money. Uh, we want tens of thousands of people to get involved. So if they want to get everyone involved, don't they have to kind of take everyone then when they decide to do this process? It's exactly like you're saying. It is kind of trying to have your cake and eat it, too. It's trying to say, well, we want to you know, keep things... Uh, keep things to people who really are supporters of the party, people who really do uh, intend to vote for the party, people who have its best interests at hand. But we also kind of want everybody. Uh, and I think that's where they've run into trouble here. It, it, it's hard to do that and have it run smoothly. We saw a number of debates and town halls in the lead up to that uh, close of people being able to sign up. Uh, let's talk a bit about the performances we saw from John Abbott and Andrew Fury there. Do you think anything in those debates actually changed anyone's mind here? 
You know, it's possible that it did. I mean, so especially the the debate that you hosted on CBC, I think that there was a little bit more substance to that than than some of the other ones that I had seen. Um, I think a few more policy positions came out. I think that there's also still a fair bit of vagueness. Uh, I think there's a lot of sort of reverting to just saying things that people are are happy to hear. Um, but we do get some distinction between the two the two candidates. I think that one of the the biggest problems for John Abbott is this idea that he's going to stand up to Ottawa by not turning on Muskrat Falls. Uh, I don't think he's really made a compelling case that that's uh, either possible or reasonable. Um, and he'd really be it'd be helped a lot if he could get an expert to come along and kind of explain how that would work. I, I, so I feel like that's a real big problem for him. Um, and on the flip side, I mean, we do see sort of a balance in terms of their different positions. I would say in some cases, I think Abbott comes across as much more knowledgeable and credible. I think he knows a lot more about the healthcare system and, and administration. I think that's a big part of his platform. I don't get that same impression from Fury. I don't think that saying that you're a doctor and you, you know who the nurses are, it really is a, a good way of kind of explaining his position on that. But, you know, it goes back in, like, I, I do think that there's enough different things that you probably could look at. Uh, to distinguish the, the candidates. The only flip side to all of that is that I think that uh, Fury has been the front runner from day one. He's supported by the entire caucus and cabinet uh, that currently is in government. So, you know, Abbott is really kind of coming from behind and I think he remains far behind. I don't think it matters that much if uh, a small proportion of people change their minds from the policy positions they hear. Well, an interesting perspective. Thanks for sharing it with me today. Thanks for having me. An update on Robin Legros situation. The party has reversed its decision after appealing her rejection. She got an email this afternoon saying that she will be allowed to vote in the upcoming leadership race. While St. John's Pride will look a little different this year, the festival kicks off tomorrow and is being called a celebration from isolation. Many activities, including next Sunday's Pride Parade are going virtual, but it's not all online. Rainbow car crosswalks like these ones are popping up all around the capital city. They've got some at the campus from Memorial University, the RCMP headquarters, and this one downtown. Stay with us, there's more here and now to come.
Welcome back to Here and Now. The World Health Organization is setting up an independent panel to review its handling of the COVID-19 pandemic and the response by various governments. This is a time for self-reflection. To look at the world we live in and to find ways to strengthen our collaboration. The Director General made the announcement today during a virtual meeting. Former New Zealand Prime Minister Helen Clark and the former Liberian President have agreed to head the panel and choose its members. The announcement comes two days after Donald Trump started the process of ending the relationship between the U.S. and the WHO. The, president, the presidents accused the organization of mishandling the COVID-19 pandemic and of being controlled by China. Now that the Atlantic bubble is open, many are bracing for a time when restrictions ease on national travel. Some are eager to move between the provinces, Other worry, others rather worry that it could lead to that dreaded second wave of COVID. No matter your stance, the province says it's not looking beyond the bubble, at least not yet. Certainly we have seen, um, you know, improvement in a lot of areas through uh, across the country. Uh, we've certainly made gains um, a lot of the provinces that were having difficulties have made uh, a lot of gains. So, you know, I think we're moving in the right direction. Uh, but as we've seen with COVID, things can change quickly. So I'm certainly not going to predict. And I think you guys know that by now that I'm not going to make predictions. So uh, we're going to see what happens. And what we said is that the Atlantic bubble on July 3rd, uh, the earliest possible date that if we were to expand this would be the 17th of July. We're not having any discussions on that date yet. We would continue to monitor. Uh, we know that in the, in the, around the province right now, there's considerable uh, fear, I would say, in opening up those borders. We recognize that from a Newfoundland and Labrador perspective, that the areas that we align up and have more traveling, uh, travelers that come into our province would be from provinces like Alberta, provinces like Ontario. And, but before a decision would be made on expansion of any travel, we would be working with public health based on the epidemiology of where, where that would be, continue to monitor. There's no date set for when that would be. The only thing that was significant about July the 17th, that would be the possible earliest date. So we'll continue to work with public health, continue to work with other provinces, and continue to monitor very closely what's happening around the country uh, before any decision is made. First and foremost, so I can assure people in Newfoundland and Labrador, it will be the safety of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians that will be the priority and will be uh, what will influence the decision that's made by all of us before we open up any more uh, and ease any more travel restrictions. More than 60 years ago, people in this province were arming themselves against a different disease, tuberculosis. The public had to register for TB tests, and to get tested, many had to board a boat. At the time, the MV Christmas Seal was thought to be the only floating X-ray service in the world. The crew circled the island and the coast of Labrador, offering TB testing to those rural communities. In 1961, they made a stop in Beta Verde. The CBC's Darcy Farty was there. Behind me is the motor vessel Christmas Seal, just arrived in Beta Verde Harbor, battle with the fishing boats of the men of this community. The Christmas Seal is believed to be the only floating X-ray unit in the world. Because most of our settlements are on the coastline here in Newfoundland, and very hard to get to by road, the work of this boat is indispensable. It was brought from the United States Navy as war surplus in 1947. Since then, it has circled the island four times. It also covers the coast of Labrador. In 1960, more than 33,000 x-rays were taken aboard the ship. 55,000 were taken in 1959. People used to be reluctant, and some still are, to come to the boat for x-rays. But now I'm told most people are disappointed if the boat passes them by. School children and adults alike line up to register and then be x-rayed. The film is developed on the ship and read immediately if a doctor is aboard. If the doctor is not aboard, the x-rays are sent to St. John's, and the ship will return to the community later to give further tests to those whose plates show some abnormalities. The x-ray survey is not an impersonal thing. People are attracted to the boat by music and announcements. The friendly captain, Peter Trove, takes a lively interest in the survey. He chats with the people and even coaxes them aboard. The Newfoundland Tuberculosis Association can easily see the results of this ship's work. 
Newfoundland tuberculosis death rate in 1959, although still the highest in Canada, 12 per 100,000, is the lowest ever recorded in the province. And the important work of the Christmas seal continues. This is Darius Ferdy in Beta Verde. Well, back to some more current national news. Eight Edmonton police officers are being investigated for their arrest of two men back in May. One who was falsely accused of driving a stolen vehicle and another who recorded the man's arrest. Neither is currently facing any charges. And there are allegations that police used excessive force. The CBC's Paige Parsons reports. You don't need to grab me. Why are you hitting my head? Jamie Dean Souter was in a downtown Circle K when six police officers rushed in and headed straight for him. Another customer began filming the incident. With Souter on the floor in handcuff, the attack continued. Souter says an officer ran his boot across his face while he lay on the ground, and that a hood was placed over his head, making it hard to breathe. Police arrested him for possession of a stolen car. They did not check his license or registration during the arrest, but eventually determined Souter's license plate had been stolen and replaced with one from a stolen vehicle. He says he continues to suffer from injuries sustained that day and called the officers involved sadistic. I would like to see these officers publicly um, held accountable. I would like to see real disciplinary actions happen. Souter was never charged, but the man who filmed his arrest was. He faced one count of obstructing a police officer. What are you doing to me? Powell says he's traumatized by what happened that day and that it's changed his opinion about police. Now I'm thinking, yeah, if I call the police for just a general issue and they show up, will I become the victim again? Powell's lawyer called the charge against his client false and malicious. It might sound surprising to say this, but the police officers kidnapped him and unlawfully confined him. Those are serious criminal offenses. After CBC reported on the case, prosecutors stayed the charge. Paige Parsons, CBC News, Edmonton. Yesterday, Edmonton police released a statement saying an investigation into the first arrest was launched in May and an investigation into the second one was initiated last month. Police say both are in the early stages. There are new re revelations in the violent arrest and killing of George Floyd. His death was caught on video and set off weeks of protest across the U.S., in Canada and around the world. Now, police body cameras reveal Floyd begged for his life for more than 20 times in the moments before his death. While former officer Derek Chavin knelt on his neck, Floyd said, You're going to kill me, man. Chavin responds, Then stop talking, stop yelling. It takes a heck of a lot of oxygen to talk. Floyd says, They're killing me, they're killing me. I can't breathe, I can't breathe. At one point, one of the other officers, Thomas Lane, asks if they should roll Floyd on his side. Chauvin says, no, he's staying where we've got him. Lane responds, okay, I just worry about the excited delirium or whatever. Chauvin says, that's why we've got an ambulance coming. Chauvin faces several charges, including second-degree murder. The other three officers involved are charged with aiding and abetting murder. A lack of child care could stand in the way of Canada's economic recovery. Some facilities are open, but with limited capacity, and that has both parents and daycare operators worried about what's to come. The CBC's Jacqueline Hansen explains. It's double duty for the Woodwards, both now working from home due to COVID-19. It's hard. I mean, I'll be honest, there are days that I am, I'm tired. The childcare they used to rely on has reopened, but capacity is limited, and there's no plan announced yet for school in the fall. Come September, uh, if I do have to go back into the office, before and after care becomes a very big concern for us. It could become an economic roadblock. So we do have people now on our waiting list that need care. Kim Yeaman's opening one of her child care centers next week. She's bringing back all 10 staff, but instead of 80 children, she can take only 24. This is a severe loss situation that even with the 75% wage subsidy, their fees will not even offset the cost of those staff. 
If capacity remains capped and the federal wage subsidy and rent relief run out, we would be closed. And childcare spaces could disappear permanently. Now we're going to lose some share of it. And there seems to be no plan to preserve that capacity. This economist says that could hit women hardest. They've already lost more jobs than men due to COVID-19, what she calls a she-session. For any kind of she covery. In other words, women being able to go back to work should there be a job there for them. If they don't have childcare, they can't go back. A smaller workforce, lower productivity, and less consumer spending. We are actually staring down the barrel of an economic depression. Ottawa is giving that $14 billion to the provinces to help get people back to work, but it's not specifically for childcare. Daycare providers want a plan, and so do parents. Continuing like this, likely isn't sustainable. If I had to, I, I would, I could. Um, do I want to? No. <laughs> Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Welcome back to Here and Now. The Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police says personal use of illicit drugs should be decriminalized. At a virtual media conference a short time ago, the organization's president, Adam Palmer, said approaching drug use as a health problem 
can reduce overdoses and save lives. It would also let police focus on organized crime and drug trafficking. Here's part of today's announcement. Here today to officially state that the CACP recognizes substance use and addiction as a public health issue. Being addicted to a controlled substance is not a crime and should not be treated as such. We are calling for the decriminalization of the possession of illicit drugs for personal use. The CACP endorses alternatives to criminal sanctions for simple possession of illicit drugs for personal consumption. In other words, we recommend that Canada's enforcement-based approach for possession be replaced with a health care approach that diverts people from the criminal justice system. Arresting individuals for simple possession of illicit drugs has proven to be ineffective. It does not save lives. Our research has taught us that other countries have boldly chosen to take a health rather than an enforcement-based approach to substance use and addiction and have demonstrated positive results. Well, before we go, we have a little bit of time for some nostalgia. Tomorrow marks the 40th anniversary of Baby Beluga, the children's song about a little white whale's journey. It's the creation of Rafi, one of the world's best-known children's entertainers. To celebrate the anniversary, he and cellist Yo-Yo Ma have recorded this video. Baby Beluga is the water warm. Is your mama home with you so happy? Well, Rafi has been one of the world's best-selling children's entertainers for two generations. I'm betting you could probably even sing along to some of those lyrics, because Baby Beluga is one of the most enduring of all his children's songs. How popular is it? Well, it's been streamed more than 25 million times on Apple Music and Spotify, and more than two million copies of the album have been sold since he originally released it in 1980. And that's it for Here and Now for this Thursday evening. I'm Peter Cowan. Thanks so much for watching. I'll be back tomorrow night with another edition of the show. Take care.